a aloha it is september 21st monday 2020 and we are thrilled to have kit weinkoop joining us again to talk about some tibetan shambhala meditation we spent a very brief time before talking about this uh topic which can help all of us in our daily lives especially now when we need it most kit thank you so much for joining us again Aloha, Winston. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, I wanted to, right before we, we start, I want to put people on your website so that they can go for more information, so they can follow along. It's a great website. What is your website? It's hoikaha.org, and that's spelled H-O-I-K-A-H-A.org. H-O-I-K-A-H-A.org. Correct. Hoikaha. And what does that mean? Well, literally, it means return to the breath, but the kauna is uh, breathing life back into. Breathing life back into. Correct. Okay. Today, our, our, t our title is Steps to Living Aloha, Mindfulness Leads to Aloha. And uh, our description is that uh, which I think is good, and I'd like to read it. Caring for everything that can be seen, heard, smelled, tasted, touched, sensed, and imagined as if it were the most important thing in the universe had been lived as a spiritual practice in Hawaii from antiquity up to as late as the 1980s. Today, it's called the Aloha Spirit, but to the Hawaiians of old, living Aloha was part of the culture and didn't even have a name. To feed a stranger passing by, that is pure aloha. We need to start letting ourselves live aloha once again, or more accurately, be lived by aloha. This is what makes positive change in the world. Aloha is the spirit of all existence. It's the life force energy of the universe. It's the true nature of reality. It is the underlying consciousness of all that is. This aloha can be discovered through Tibetan Buddhist meditation to connect with and live it. Living aloha leads one to experience a life of generosity, loving kindness, compassion, and virtue, thereby bringing balance, peace, and harmony to oneself, the planet, and all sentient beings. That sounds lovely and a state that we should all be in. <laughs> Tell us, um, if we practice this, what percent of the time can we live in aloha like this? Or do you think it's... Well, I mean, that's a very good question. I'm still working on it myself, so I don't have a personal answer from experience. But from what I understand and what I remember as a kid, there were still people alive um, back then who were living from aloha. And, you know, there's a there's a gentleness that comes across. In fact, I uh, met a woman uh, recently who really exhibit this, exhibited this. She was very gentle. Um, she was very caring. And you could just feel her aloha reaching out. And that's how she lives, you know. And uh, there were certainly more people, a lot more people back in the uh, 60s here that uh, were living that way. But the <clears throat> Tibetan Buddhist meditation masters would say, uh, it's totally possible. It's possible to work your way to 100% of living like that. And they would not use the term aloha, but they would use Buddha nature or the true uh, nature of reality. Is this the same as a, like a Christ consciousness or? Um... Yeah, precisely. Yeah, that's totally and, and just so uh, our, our viewers might be clear, you are what we might call local Haole. You grew up here, right? And you were hanai by a local Hawaiian family down the street. Is that is that right? That's correct. In my off time from my own parents, <laughs> they didn't want me in the house a lot. So I just sort of ventured down the street and a very kind, uh, older Hawaiian, native Hawaiian couple adopted me essentially and sort of uh, taught me you know, what uh, Hawaii culture is all about and uh, predominantly about aloha and how to uh, exhibit that and recognize it and uh, share it with others. Uh, did, did they teach you 
um, openly or was it just through example or both? It was pretty much both, you know, uh, and it was the old uh, Hawaii way of learning <clears throat> that if you were, if I was exhibiting, uh, you know, a less than aloha uh, <laughs> name, <laughs> you know, it was very gentle. Again, it was very gentle. It's like, no, no, boy, that's not how we do things here. You know, <laughs> it wasn't scolding. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's interesting because the Tibetan Buddhist meditation is uh, uh, instruction and guidance is all about being gentle. Uh, the instructor is gentle with the students and they, the instructors uh, indicate to the students that it's highly important to be gentle with ourselves. It, meditation on the path to living aloha is a, a path of becoming our own best friends. So um, it's important to sort of connect that way. That's a, that's a, a wonderful point. And, uh, you know, starting with, with gentleness, so no one's going to come up behind you in your classes and smack you with a, uh, a read to sit up straighter or anything like that, right? Uh, I mean, that was a question that we had. How is this different? How is uh, Tibetan Shambhala Buddhist meditation different than other forms of meditation? Or, or is it uh, or, or is it substantially different? And how would you say that it is it so? Well, I think it's very similar to other sects of um, Buddhism, uh, Buddhist meditation. You know, there are five or six uh, uh, natural uh, uh, sects of um, Tibetan Buddhist meditation, and they're all very similar, except that the Shambhala version sort of works one up to where uh, the other sects kind of plop people right into. It's kind of um, like being pushed into the deep end of the pool, where Shambhala is sort of like, come down the steps in the, the shallow end, and we'll sort of guide you out to the deep end so it's not so such a jolt. Um, in uh, difference in, uh, with other uh, meditation techniques is that those techniques are very much a uh, concentration it, as opposed to the Buddhist uh, meditation technique, which is essentially letting go. And so we're letting go of um, you know, what we're holding on to about ourselves and the worlds and our attitudes and um, but uh, uh, other, other uh, more modern meditations are pretty much about concentrating on something, you know, some form of mantra or something of that sort. So is, uh, when, we, when we meditate, um, is it that we want to be detach from our from our uh, what's around us or engaged with what's around us or maybe both or how would you what's the purpose of meditation because a lot of people I think in the West struggle with this idea of meditation and people say I, I can't meditate but right? you probably heard that many times <laughs> yes yeah uh, I can't meditate there are too many thoughts in my head you know I don't have enough time and <clears throat> meditation is actually being able to uh, live with all of that without those thoughts or that lack of time uh, dictating how we live in the world. Uh, so meditation, again, is essentially letting go of control. Um, and it is grounding ourselves in just being fully human. So we're not uh, zoning out. <laughs> we're not sort of getting into a... Uh, you know, what some people may say is bliss out or blissful state, but more along the lines of observing and uh, strengthening our mind to uh, really be able to allow all of the distraction and chaos to happen around us without, <clears throat> without us grabbing a hold of it or um, uh, being attached to that and reacting. Um, so sort of just a letting life be letting life come at, at us as it does, and then being able to deal with it as best as uh, in, a, in a more fully present manner. Um, in, in, yes, and it's also allowing all of our sense perceptions to come in and uh, working with those as a path to uh, allowing ourselves to see what we hear, what we uh, see, uh, feel.
you know, all of that into our lives and allow it to just be and observe it from a place of equanimity or uh, the middle way. Fully present in a place of equanimity. Yeah. Okay, because I, I think that's uh, a lot of people maybe think of, of meditation as, I don't know, it's it's an interesting thing. It's uh, maybe escape or, or something. How many times would you say you meditate in a day? Do you meditate for 30 seconds at a time or for 30 minutes or, or all over the map? Well, I personally have two formal meditation periods, one in the morning and one around 5.30 in the afternoon. And so the one in the morning is about an hour and a half. But I do a <clears throat> basic meditation, uh, the kind of what we're talking about. And then I have another practice that I do on top of that afternoon. Yeah. It's basic meditation. And you also teach meditation. Tell us about what, what you have, how, what... Um meditations you do and also what other services that you offer uh, that people might find useful well i teach shamatha vipassana which is literally mindfulness awareness meditation as taught by the historic buddha to dala sanko who was the king of shambhala at the time and he wanted a practice that he could take back to his kingdom which was pretty much in the same social uh, disaster as we are right now and uh, he uh, uh, was able to live in the world as opposed to becoming a monk. You don't have to be a monk if you meditate. So we can live in the world our, our full lives and still meditate. And we can actually take that meditation up off the cushion into our daily lives. So the first part of the journey is really building a foundation of uh, this uh, mindfulness awareness meditation so that we can easily uh, pull that into our uh, uh, awareness throughout the day when things are chaotic or you know stressful and we can sort of just drop into that meditation still be aware our eyes are open and we're actually engaging at the same time do you teach a, a technique to be sort of Pavlovian uh, in response when, when some you know, stressor, when you start to feel wigging out that you, oh, this is the time I can start meditating? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's a training where we're training our mind no different than going to the gym to uh, be aware of when we're about to have an emotional response to something. And uh, it's almost like an aha moment as we go through this path of meditation, it's like we get better and better, we get stronger and stronger at being able to do this, but we can actually start to feel ourselves being pulled or hooked into a reaction that might not turn out very pleasantly for ourselves or other people. And then at that point, when we notice that arising, we can actually uh, make a choice whether we want to continue down to that <laughs> that pathway or just let that emotion course through our bodies and out as opposed to just holding on to it. So and, being, maybe being able to be response able instead of uh, just reactive. That's a very good way of putting it. Uh, you know, a, a question about this, I think, um, can we be, can we be active people engaged in our community? Maybe uh, it's not, necessarily to get rid of emotions certainly or 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 not not feel sadness or anger or loss that's not what it's about is it no not at all in fact that's a natural part of life as human being you know we can't get rid of our thoughts we can't get rid of the distractions or chaos or uh, emotions that arise uh, in relation to things that people say or things that happen around us but what we can do is work with our own minds in those situations to be able to uh, come to a place of peaceful abiding and observation, almost like going to a movie, seeing it for what it actually is without uh, a conditioned response of uh, habitual speaking or acting that uh, we've been carrying all our lives. And that's actually what's happening in the world today to bring it to such a chaotic place is that, you know, people have, uh, you know, lived their lives as they always have. And um, 
and yet they're, they're not aware that most of those actions, most of the words that come out of their mouths um, are uh, habituated from uh, very early on. And certainly everybody has had a moment where they say, oh my God, I think I just sounded like my parents. And that, that's just a small tip of the ice. I wanted to, to follow up on the, that idea of classes. We have a, a question from a viewer who just uh, beamed in and said, do you teach students via Zoom? And if you do, is it harder? What are your classes? When are they offered? Are they different levels? Do you do private classes or are they group classes? Um, and, and how does that work? Yeah, I do it all. <laughs> and it's all via Zoom right now. Um, I have one student who's a close friend who comes over uh, and we sit like eight feet apart and wear masks. Socially distance meditate, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, predominantly my classes are uh, on Zoom and uh, it's essentially an hour and a half to two hours uh, of time uh, where we sit and we meditate and then there's a lesson and then there's a discussion and this can happen uh, on an individual basis or with a group, I, I have them all. So it's quite, um, you know, from an individual, uh, some people just want to be on their own when they're in a learning environment, which is totally cool. And then uh, some people like being in groups and from a group interaction, there's certainly more wisdom that arises out of the students that uh, share their experiences. And this can spark deeper learning for other um, uh, students and sessions. Do you have an ongoing class right now? And if so, what are the requirements for students? Well, um, I, I don't have an ongoing class. It would, it's sort of a successive um, learning path. So we would start with one and then go to two and then go to three and so on. Um, so uh, I'm always looking to start new classes if there's anyone that wishes to do that. And uh, what was the other part of your question? Uh, what, is, what do you require of students? Oh, just um, simply a, a, a commitment to uh, sit uh, for 20 minutes every day in meditation and uh, do the studies, which are not very much. I usually send out a few articles to read each week. And they're weekly classes. And then be open for discussion, you know, uh, about, uh, you know, uh, what they um, glean out of the lessons and any questions they may have. Is, um, you know, given our We've had a lot of I, I what we call, maybe call new age or new thought um, permeate our our consciousness in America since probably the '60s. I'm just guessing um, as a response to both globalization and also uh, people wanting something different than perhaps they were raised with that, that wasn't fitting their paradigm. And certainly, we didn't have a lot of Tibetan Buddhist Shambhala teachers <laughs> or people that had experienced that. Um, but I, I do know that Paramahasa Yogananda filled the Los Angeles uh, Coliseum back in the 20s or 30s. I mean, this was, you know, tens of thousands of people coming out to see this Indian guru. And that was across the United States. I think he came for the, the Conference of World Religions. Uh, so so uh, that's the you know, autobiography, uh, autobiography of a yogi. And it's a, you know, really interesting that it started. And there's, I think, been Americans have been open to a certain um, you know, curiosity about uh, Eastern religions and mysticism and all uh, everything else um, uh, going. So it's, uh, is this, but my question is, given our times, we wake up in the morning and somebody may still be president. That's just extremely, you know, frustrating for some percentage of the population or Maybe for others, it's that uh, somebody else was the president that they didn't like, and, and now that's over, but they're, they're dreading what, what could be next. When we're confronted with this sort of onslaught of um, daily uh, assaults to our psyche, to our well-being, our um, a mental, emotional, psychological, social structure, and it's coming so fast on the internet, unless you're completely disconnected, and even then, 
Um, we're living in COVID times, so we can't even get together with our pals, even if we're not on the internet and go down to the park and have a picnic. Um, how do we stay engaged in the world, but stay balanced? I, I, or can we be engaged in the world? Or do we just have to pull back from it and quit Facebook and quit TV and just meditate? Or can we do both? Can we be engaged and can we be angry and can we be um, challenging what is really we find uh, uh, morally or ethically offensive and still remain engaged in a Buddhist contemplative or even just meditative practice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I recently, uh, speaking of Facebook, saw a meme where uh, there was a yogi and there was a student and the student said, what is the problem with the world? And the yogi said, you've disconnected from the source. And that's absolutely the very issue, no matter what you call source from your beliefs, uh, belief traditions. Um, uh, we've, you know, I call it aloha uh, in the tradition of uh, Pilahi Paki. Um, you know, it's, we've forgotten how to be with that all all-knowing, all-pervasive energy of the universe. The, even quantum physics has proven it, that you know, the, at the submolecular level, it's pure light, it's pure love. And we have forgotten how to vibrate or at that frequency. And we've gotten so caught up into our own egos that um, uh, we have been lost in how we are out in the world. In uh, Tibetan Buddhist meditation and uh, other techniques, I mean, Yogananda taught just pure love, be love, you know, love each other, um, gets to back to that place where we're trying to get back to the true um, nature of reality, which is that place, which is aloha. And we can do that through meditation uh, very easily. Um, uh, it takes practice. And it takes dedication to keep it up. But uh, very quickly, people notice that uh, they start to connect with that aloha. And it is so beautiful that that is what inspires them to continue meditating and continue along the path of meditation. Uh, you know, we got another question coming in from a, a viewer who asks, um, it says, I have uh, Af Afin Tazia, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm getting that right, aphantasia, an inability to visualize mental images. So it's hard for me to do typical meditation, like visualizing myself on a beach and just breathing. Do you think I can do this type of meditation? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Again, uh, harking back to what we were talking about earlier, because it's not concentration. Those visualization techniques are a way of concentrating. So because uh, Shavata Vipassana is all about just uh, uh, finding one thing to be mindful of, and that would be the breath, and allowing ourselves to let all the distractions come in and not be bothered by them as we, uh, uh, I don't want to say focus, that's too strong a word, be aware of our, our breathing. And... Uh, of course, at the beginning, it's a little uh, challenging, but very quickly, within a week's time, people start to see success. Could we, uh, you know, we, we don't have uh, many minutes left. Could we, could we do a three-minute meditation to, and uh, take us out of the, uh, is, that, is that appropriate to do something like that, to just give people a, a sense of what we can get, even in three minutes? Yeah, I think so. So it's a seated meditation, so we would be seated. And our eyes are open and they're uh, gazing at the floor a few feet out from us, about four to six feet. And our hands are on our thighs. I'll mind the time. And just become aware of your breathing. How your body moves when you're breathing. How your body feels. Follow the in and out breath. Now just follow the out breath only. 
And really look at it. Notice how it starts in your lungs and it comes out through the esophagus and the nasal passageways. And it flows out of the body and dissolves into the space around us. Feel that and follow it. And if you can, become the outbreath in your imagination. Feeling it, following it, flowing out of the body and dissolving into space. And you might be, mind might spark with a sound or because of a visual in front of you because your eyes are open. And it'll label it and categorize it and have an opinion about it and lead you down some storyline about it or something else completely different. And all of a sudden, you're not even here. When you notice that, simply acknowledge it by saying, thinking, and come back to follow the out-breath, relaxing outward. Every time you're distracted, just simply come back to the out-breath. Acknowledge the distraction by saying, thank you. And come back to the out-breath, relaxing outward. One helpful hint in uh, these meditations is thinking of thoughts as clouds. And as they arise, we acknowledge them by saying, thank you. And then just watch the clouds dissolve right back into a vast open sky. So, Winston, this is really just a very touch into uh, a full meditation. I usually take about a half an hour just for meditation instruction. But, you know, we're, we're acknowledging the thinking, you know, the distractions, the smells, everything we uh, sense through our sense perceptions. We're acknowledging that it's happening. And yet we come back to this out breath feeling the peaceful abiding of just sort of flowing out and dissolving into space. And as we do that, we're, we're building, we're strengthening our ability to um, be mindful of one thing and saying, yes, these other things are there. And yet uh, this is, this was my aim. I'm following this breath and thank you other things, you know, but the more we do that, the more proficient we become at it, and the more we can uh, live our lives in peaceful abiding. And aloha. And aloha. I, you know, I, I, even just a short time, I, your voice is very calming for me, so I could just, it's, it's uh, uh, almost hypnotic, but it, it, it just gets me in a calm place right away. I think for folks, Everybody needs this. There's nobody who could not benefit from this, especially now. I will refer them to your website, hoikaha.org, H-O-I-K-A-H-A.org. Kit is a marvelous teacher. He's um, the real deal and been there and done that and um, can lead you to a greater sense of aloha within the side of yourself. And so you can deal with everything else around you that's coming so fast. I want to thank you for being with us today, Kit. You're going to come back again, and maybe we can just do a show only that's just meditation um, so we can get more there. That would be awesome. Thank you, Winston. Thank you again. And uh, everyone, I hope you've enjoyed the show. I have. Um, there's so much to explore here and unpack. Please go to Kit's website, and we will look forward to seeing you another time here on Out and About.